Bom, a gente tem o prazer de receber hoje para dar essa palestra da arte e ensinar física, o professor Hans Jordan, da Universidade de Groninger, na Holanda. O professor Hans ele é um físico teórico formado, doutorado também pela Universidade de Groninger. Ele professor lá durante 30 anos e nesse meio tempo ele se dedicou ao ensino de física uh, na Holanda e em outros países também. Ele vai falar um pouco sobre isso hoje. E nos últimos 10 anos ele é o presidente da Olimpíada Internacional de Física, que é um evento que acontece uma vez por ano em um, um país do em um, em um, em um país do, que faz parte da, dessa comunidade. O Brasil participa da Olimpíada Internacional de Física desde 1999. Nesses dez anos, o professor Hans ele teve contato com praticamente, não só, né? ele também vem participando desde 1982 da, como membro do time da Holanda da Olimpíada Internacional de Física, mas nesses últimos dez anos como presidente ele teve contato com é, membros desses países que organizam, então ele pôde ter contato também e ver como é, que é o sistema de ensino e, a, de, e também a infraestrutura que de, de, de ensino de física nesse país. Então ele tem uma, uma grande visão global né, hoje de como que é esse é, como que é o ensino de física no mundo, tá certo? Bom, uh, I just say a few words about you. Uh, you are a theoretical physicist, PhD on University of Groningen, Netherlands, and uh, you devote your Uh, career in the physics as a lecturer, teaching physics not only in the Netherlands but around the world, some countries. And uh, in Netherlands, you uh, conduct the Physics Olympiad for 25 years. 25 years. And in the last 10 years, he is the president of the Physics Olympiad and he knows a lot of about. Uh, how is the physics education probably all the countries in the world so has a lot of peculiarities so he will uh, give a talk so the art of teaching physics explain a, a little about uh, the whole experience that he got through those years so I'd like to thank Professor Hans to uh, accept our invitation so it's a Okay. All of you. Uh, Thank you very much. I'm grateful that I'm invited to give a talk to you. And uh, I, the invitation was that I would say a couple of words about physics competitions that I will do. But I think these uh, physics competitions cannot be done without teachers and teaching physics, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So I will say, I will start saying something about that, about teaching physics, about physicists, and especially about teachers in physics. That's why I chose this title. It's a bit, little bit provocative title, but the more I thought about it, the more correct I think it is. I tell you a little anecdote. I was uh, many years ago in a foreign country, and I was there to set up a uh, teacher training center. It had to be a new university, and okay, there were also local teachers involved, and one day, one of them uh, invited me for a an, an lecture he would give in his own class, because he was also teaching in high school. So I went there, and then he started in full classroom, saying, well, he wrote on the blackboard a formula, and he said this. Basically, he said it in French. Je vous par la suite une formule. And I was absolutely astonished, shocked. Well, how can you start a lecture in physics doing this? What is the formula? It's a collection of symbols, letters, no one understands, and now you, this will be the start of your, of your uh, lecture. 
How can you do that? I must say, by time, I'm growing older. I, I'm not growing, I'm already old. Uh, and uh, by time, I st started maybe to understand a little bit that it could have also had its positive sides to do it this way. Basically, there's a lot to be said about formulas, about the structure, etc. Many people, students, my family mostly, friends don't understand nothing about formulas. For them, it's something like magic. Uh, you cannot understand, but when you apply the rules correctly, you, correct, you, can, you get the correct answer. That's all. Uh, but that's not true. I'm a theoretical physicist, and I've learned to see structure in formulas. You understand why they are like that, and why nature doesn't have a choice or very little choices. Okay, so the image I got when he said that is something like this. Je vous parachute une formule. In case you are wondering who this is, it's me. I'm really parachuting the formula. It's true. Uh, so you can ask yourself a couple of questions. Is this the kind of teaching physics? Uh, what about the context? Context nowadays is very, in, in, uh, it, it's a hype, I would say. Uh, you hardly, at least in the Netherlands, and I think in Western Europe it's the same, you cannot talk about physics when there is no context. For instance, these problems, there's a lot of big story, you know, what's going on, and you have to pick out the, 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 the marbles that will tell you, okay, this is what the problem is all about. This is a little bit an exaggeration, of course, of context. But nevertheless, when you uh, tell the story and, and make the student understand uh, where this, in what kind of an environment this problem plays a role, okay. Some people think it helps. You have different options. You can say, abandon as much formulas as possible. That is really true. There are people who say that. Because the formula is something you really you cannot understand. So away with it. Uh, as qualitative as possible. Um, another one is, no, I mean, formula should derive it from theory and, uh, or by th experiment. Uh, uh, anyway, sort of like that. And I think most of you, you will be teachers, you are teachers, you're in the training centers, and you have to ask yourself these questions. What will I do? Now, to come back to the the, the, the title of this uh, presentation, about the art. F for personal reasons, will be, which will be clear quite soon, I strongly believe that there is a very close connection between artists and scientists, and of course also teachers in science. They have a lot in common. By the way, what will a student be without a good teacher? That basically means the role of a teacher is very important. You cannot do without a teacher. Uh, for some students can do without a good teacher. Because they are good themselves, they can teach themselves the subjects, that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. But quite a few, they need a teacher. And when you ask people who started uh, to get to in, uh, in research and so on, very often you will hear, I had such an enthusiastic teacher. Not that that was the reason to start uh, studying science or something, but it helped a lot. So what is the, the uh, connection between teachers and artists? Well, first of all, knowledge for the teachers and for the scientists and craftsmanship for the artists. They have to do something. And I cannot underline this enough. You, when you want to be a good teacher, you have to know your subject very, very well. You must be a very, very good scientist. And since you deal with students, with people who have difficulty in understanding, you should und know uh, that there are different approaches. Well, we were just talking about it in, in, in mathematics, uh, that there are different approaches to explain the same thing. And you have to, you have, to have that craftsmanship, that knowledge, to be able to be a good teacher, to understand what is the problem of the student, to place yourself in the, in the chair in the place of the student himself. And to be able to do that, 
you have to be a top scientist. Absolutely. Creativity is very important. Without creativity, you're nowhere. Uh, you must try things uh, while well, other people will say, well, this is a dead end. It's you're losing time and energy uh, to pursue that way. Nevertheless, try it. The same holds for artists, of course. An artist without creativity is not an artist. He's, um, he makes a reproduction of something. And performance. There are more things, but I very strongly believe in performance. I'm here in this arena, and you are sitting there, and I really think I have to perform in front of you. And when I teach, uh, there is not an hour of teaching for me without demonstrations. Especially in physics, it's very simple. Physics basically is a very simple science. Uh, we can re if, if the problem is difficult, we can reduce it till a level we understand without re really destroying the problem. You cannot do it in biology when you want to study a cell, uh, and, and that's a very complex thing. You cannot just cut a cell in, in different pieces and start to study it because it's no cell anymore, it doesn't work, right? So the biologists have a much more difficult job to do than a physicist. And maybe that's why the physicists came so far. I don't know, but that is it. Okay, and that, that means also that uh, uh, even difficult and basic concepts can very often be shown in very simple ways by simple demonstration. I will tell you something about that. Okay, well, we have here a picture, a photo. Well, it's taken basically from Google Earth of a part in the Netherlands. We have dunes also, like here, not that high, but nevertheless. And uh, okay, why did I choose this one. This is a picture. And you might think it is, okay, like you when you look around, okay, you have an image of this uh, hall and all the people there are in, and you think, well, that's reality. Well, let me tell you something new, it is not. It is absolutely not the reality, because you miss a lot. We only see a very tiny uh, part of the uh, electromagnetic waves. And we miss all the rest. For instance, infrareds should have been very nice if we could see it. Because uh, I, I read an article a couple of years ago that when people focus very much, when they're very much concentrated on something, the tip of their nose cools off, gets cooler. So when I had an infrared vision, I could see whom of you are sleepy and who are really concentrating on what I'm trying to say. Right? That should have given me information, valuable information, which I'm missing now. And so that is part of reality which I don't see. That's with a picture also. You might think that is really as it is, but it is not. It's not the same view, but sort of. This is made some 60 years ago by my grandfather. He was a painter. And, uh, okay. He started like all, anyone else. He could paint fantastically, draw drawings exactly as it was. But more and more in his life, when he drew this, he had about the age I have, uh, he started to make it more and more abstract. And why do artists do that? Not because my grandfather had a problem with his eyes or something. No, because he wanted to express something different from the exact picture. Maybe he had a certain feeling and got an impression and he wanted to put that on paper. That are called the impressionists. And maybe he had wanted to well, give a message or whatever to the, to the people to make uh, this kind of a drawing. And those are the expressionists, right? But nevertheless, whatever his reason was, he would, I think, not being able even to tell me if I would ask him. Uh, but uh, it is also like the picture, a representation of the world, the nature. Both as valuable, both as true, but completely different. And that is something you have to understand in physics also. When we teach physics with all the theory, etc., you must understand that it's just a representation. It's a model anyway. It could be completely different. Yeah? But we are too dumb to know that now. Maybe in the future we will know. So, the notion that there is not one truth, but there are many, many ways, many different representations to teach 
and to, um, to use to make the students understand what, they, uh, what you want to learn them. Okay, my outline is, okay, physics is around us, just need to see it. Lots of people don't see. They have a very, I would say, those have a very bad vision. That's why uh, testimonies in court are uh, very doubtful. Yeah? When, you, when you ask, uh, well, someone is robbed or something, and there are uh, people around, and they have seen something, and they come to the police and ask, what did you see? Okay, they give a story, but very often it's wrong. Yeah? Because it, maybe, maybe you know that it's a very famous film. Uh, uh, there you see uh, two groups of basketball players, uh, two, two groups of three, and each of them, they have a ball, and they play it to the other one. But it's mixed. So it's a little bit disturbing. And the question then is, can you, in a minute or so, count how many times the two balls were played to another player? Right? So you have to count. Okay. Everybody does. I did too. And then, at the end, the question is, not how many, ball, how many times the ball was played. No, the question is, did you see something odd? And maybe out of 100 or 200 people, there's maybe one that says, yeah, there is something. There. I, I can't tell exactly, but something moved. I said, well, let me tell you what happened. There was a man dressed as an ape. He comes in front of the camera. He waves to you, and then he moves off. No one has seen it, right? So uh, our possibility our uh, uh, yeah to 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 see to observe is very limited you have to be aware of that okay uh, how to get knowledge from nature well the teacher itself then we come to this uh, competitions and the importance of that is not it's the last but definitely not the least the importance of peers Physics is around us. Well, you know, I don't need to tell you that it's the Earth. It's a very favorite picture for me. Uh, it is taken from a satellite or from one of these uh, Skylabs. And what you see is, of course, the Earth. And what you also see, I'm teaching. Well, I'm, I'm 71, you may know. I'm on pension. And uh, I'm teaching. Well, I'm, I'm not allowed anymore to teach in the university or high school or whatsoever. But I'm teaching elderly people. We have an uh, academic and uh, for elderly people, and what is an elderly people? Uh, that is someone who is over 55. When you're younger, you're not allowed to enter. So those people, they are interested. They are, it's a mixed, mixed audience in age, everything, background. Uh, some had some education in physics, others have not at all whatsoever. But nevertheless, they pay for the course, so in principle they are interested in what you're going to do. And then uh, I showed them this. I said, well, look. You have, you can here get some feeling about the thickness of the atmosphere. And it is apt very, very thin. Uh, and once you realize that really, how thin it is, then you st maybe start to realize that we have to be very careful what we do in our atmosphere. Uh, because the thin atmosphere can be easily destroyed and then it's all over. Okay, so that is one thing. You can do a lot of physics in, in, on Earth. Uh, the astronomers, they look at those things, and even a lot further. Uh, and also, well, the particle theory, uh, particle physicists, they uh, look for these uh, 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 collisions, etc., etc. Okay, that is, and everything in between, the very large and the very small, it's all physics. Now, this is a favorite motto of me. You see more when you understand what you see. Because then you know how to look. And when you do not know what you can see, you will not see it. It happened with me. Um, I don't know if you have ever heard about the green flash. When there is a sunset, then uh, especially at sea, when there is a sunset, uh, it might be in the, uh, in the occasion that you see something greenish on top of the red sun. When I was a student, I was attending a lecture from uh, someone who became very famous in the Netherlands, writing two, three volumes about the physics in nature. And uh, one volume is about optics. And this was also there, and he talked about it and said, well, it's a rare phenomena, and, but okay, when well you take care, you might be able to see it. That was in 68 or something. 
50 years ago. And uh, since then, well, I, I, can, I will not say that I missed one uh, sunset, but I looked very, very often to sunsets. I had in, the, in, the, in our institute, the laboratory, I had a room that was facing west on the third floor, fantastic view. You cannot imagine how many sunsets I've seen there. Never a green flash. Never. Till I started to understand the physics behind it and what you have to look for. Now, okay, now I know. I have, was not on the occasion to have a look at it, but I will certainly do, and it is spectacular what you can see. Well, this is the green thing, and sometimes you see a tower of greenish on top of it. This is what they call the green thing. Okay, this is a picture I took when uh, we were in Croatia, also in one of these competitions, and in an outing, uh, there were two boats, the, the students and the anyone else was divided on two boats, almost similar boats, they were racing, they went pretty fast, uh, with the same speed, at maybe 10 meters between, and uh, then I saw this wave. This wave was traveling with us for a long, uh, for a long stretch. It kept there, and it was traveling apparently with the same speed as the boat. The water waves normally don't have, well, they have different speed. Huh? But, uh, okay, you have Kelvin waves, they have the same speed as the boat. But uh, and and probably, I don't know the explanation, but probably this, is, this has to do with the Kelvin waves. But also, apparently, an interference. And look at the shape of the wave. This is very odd. It's very sharp. You know, and it, it's not the same amount of water you're seeing. No, it, it's, it's progressing. So uh, every time, new water takes the same stupid shape. It's very, sh I mean, yeah, I don't know if any one of you knows the explanation. You can tell me later on. But uh, I found it very astonishing. And, uh, okay, I'm, I'm not uh, an expert in waves, so I might find out, I don't know. Anyway, this was the situation. So how do we get knowledge about uh, nature? The prime thing is by asking questions. Uh, I'm afraid to, to say that many teachers only give answers to the students. They tell them how it is. Yeah? They tell them the theory. Those are the answers. That is basically the end of all research. Yeah? When you show them the Maxwell equations, well, uh, two centuries were necessary to come to those four equations, which basically are not from Maxwell at all. That is something that happens very often in science, that something gets, is connected with the name of a scientist, and that scientist didn't really make the final step, but someone else did. It's the same here. The four equations are not from a Maxwell needed 12 equations. But Heaviside made it four. And that's what everyone knows, the four ones. Anyway, so uh, after all the questions and experiments, uh, so questions, ask for explanation, pro possible answers, and possible answers need to be tested. And for tests in physics, for science, uh, natural science, you have to do experiments. Faraday was a very famous one, to name one, but many others as well. Okay, now, well, this, this you know probably uh, how to get knowledge. This is a very nice scheme. In practice, it will never, hardly ever fall out. But you can, just to understand how it works, uh, let's say you are a particle physicist, uh, started with the electron, and after that, more and more particles became known. And uh, in the, let's say in the 50s, they had a bunch of far uh, particles and no one knew the relation between them. Till there was uh, at a conference, Gelman in 62, and he was a specialist in group theory. And he was able to put all these particles in kinds of families. Uh, and th that means, okay, according to their properties, you could put them in families. And when you did so, uh, for instance, for this group of variants, we spin one and a half. Uh, according to the group theory, you would expect 10 members. But one was missing, the omega minus. 
that was not yet discovered. But according to this, this group, they could uh, 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 tell what the mass would be and other properties like isospin and strangers. And uh, so they, they, the, the experimentalists knew where to look for. And that's what they did. And uh, within two years, they found it. The famous omega minus. It's my favorite because I can say that is one, maybe the, the important reason why I started to when I decided I will study physics. I found it fantastic. You have a theory that makes predictions and in a short time uh, experimentalists can find out whether they see correct, the prediction is correct, yes or no. Okay, we need measurements. On large scale, this is uh, Atlas is a detector in CERN uh, in, uh, near Geneva to have an idea about the scale. This is a person, right? So this is the size of a person, and you see how large it is. What to do to register these very, very tiny particles? The smaller the particles, the bigger the machines you need to see them. Uh, but you can have very simple physics as well, balloon physics, I would say. Uh, this one too, this is a very, the LIGO, uh, this is the one that can uh, uh, detect uh, gravitational waves at a, a fantastic precision. Okay, but asking questions, that's the prime thing. Students should be provoked to ask questions. Or you ask them questions, that's more difficult for them. And uh, for instance, this one, peer instruction yesterday came a couple of times along. And uh, uh, I have been teaching quite a while according to his ideas. And for instance, this one, it's a very simple thing. Uh, you have these two boats, okay, two guns, uh, two cannons on it, they fire on the boats, and the question is, which ship is hit first? And according to logic, it's either A or B, or both in the same time. You can have uh, other alternatives as well, of course. Yeah, for instance, I don't know, or you need to know more, it cannot be answered, things like that, right? But okay, from logic, there are only three possibilities. So you should answer that. Do you know? What is, if someone knows the answer, which one will be hit first? Which one? B. You know it or you could it find out? It's Nothing is said about that. You don't know. You have it. You have it. The height determined. So it's B indeed. And the height determines the flight time. So that also determines the shorter the flight time. The shortest flight time means that chip is hit. So that will be this one here, and that is B. Oh, now I pushed the wrong button. Um, doing experiments, I understand in high school, uh, I've been teaching for 10 years in high school and then 30 years at university. Uh, that was the same problem. There is always a lack of money. And uh, experiments, uh, apparatus is expensive. So, uh, yeah, you can buy one or two things, but not 15 or uh, when you need to do experiments with the students. So this is, this is a typical instrument to determine, the, uh, to determine G, the acceleration of gravity. And uh, what happens is, okay, the ball is released. Uh, there is, uh, it takes some time. This is when it hits here. It stops, uh, there is a clock also, it's not shown, but there is a clock, electronic clock, and the clock stops. And then you can read how much time is uh, needed for the uh, sphere to fall. Now let's say that it drops one meter, that takes about uh, a bit, little bit less than half a second. Uh, let's say the precision of the electronic clock was a hundredth of a second, then you get a precision, a relative precision of in the order of 4%, 400, right? Okay, now we have this set up. And what is it? It's just uh, a stick. It doesn't need to be a uniform or nothing. Uh, it can be a branch of a tree, doesn't matter. And uh, okay, you, it can swing in this plane, and now it hangs here. This is a rope, and this is a way, so it keeps everything in balance. And what you do is you cut, you cut the rope, and then the weight falls down, and in the same time, the rod 
goes to the left and they hit. This way, right? So, first of all, how do you measure the time? Well, that's simple. It's a quarter of one period. So when you know the period, you know the time. And the period can be measured very accurately, not by just one period, uh, counting one period, but 10 or 20 or how many there are. Uh, so, and that makes the time me measurement very precise. So the time you measured, Tm, one fortieth of that, that is the time for the, the way to drop, to fall. And from the impact, you can very precisely measure uh, how long that is. So the precision and the distance is pretty good. When you do this and you calculate it, it's better than the electronic apparatus. Okay, let's say two, two tenths of a second is the precision, that's fine as well, but you get in the same order. Nevertheless, this apparatus costs something like $200 and the other one maybe 10 or even less, right? And they give you the same, uh, 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 well, the same correctness and answer. You can even, when you use different sticks of different length, you can even draft, uh, make a very nice graph, and from the slope of the graph, you get a fantastic number, which shows that sometimes, I don't say every time, but so sometimes, and that is the creativity, you should think about it, that sometimes you can uh, invent a setup that gives you a fantastic measurement. Okay, a teacher. Well, it has at least th three roles, according to me, maybe more, or m maybe for sure, as a director. So you manage what is happening in your classroom, right? So you have to find, well, to think by yourself, I'm going to do it this way. Uh, and I, therefore, I need that and that and that. So you manage the whole thing in such a way that you can do what you want to do. You are in charge of it. But you're also an assistant. You sit beside your students when they have difficulty, when they are solving problems and they don't know how to, to do it, etc. That too. Basically, the picture is taken from a competition. I will come to that later on. And you must be a performer, I find. Yeah. Oh. oh, wait a minute. Okay, you've seen the uh, slinky. I will show you. You know what's a slinky, right? So it's such a sloppy... Uh, uh, spring. Now there, it's a very. Uh, it, it, I think it is de developed to make it walk from the stairs or so, but uh, you can do. There's very nice physics in it, although it's very simple. I keep it like that, and then I let it fall. Now, okay, I don't know if you have seen something peculiar. Well, okay, let, let's not lose too much time on it. The peculiar thing is that when you focus on the bottom. I cannot reach higher than this. Okay, when you focus on the bottom, then you will notice that the bottom of the spring stays in place, doesn't move, till the spring is completely collapsed. Yeah? That's one peculiar thing. Another one, which is more difficult to see, but with a sphere I can show, that is that the top of the spring accelerates faster than G. So I will release them in the same time and then look on top and look at the top of the spring and the sphere. You see? The spring went down faster than uh, the spring went down faster than the sphere. Okay, you can think about it. You can also think, is it al always true? Uh, this has a very sloppy spring. So the spring constant is very low. But what happens when you have springs with, uh, which are more tough, with a stronger, with a higher uh, spring constant, right? And maybe in the extreme case, that the spring constant is very high, so that you can consider this as a solid thing. Now then you can be sure that something different will happen. Yeah? So there is also some intermediate uh, range where not the same ha thing happens as this. And, and I think, I never really studied it, but I think it's basically, though it's a very simple experiment, it's basically very complex and can ask many, many questions on it, 
and do research or a project of what's so okay, Here as well. Um, this is a part of a an, uh, an capacitor. You can easily make a capacitor of three buckets, two metal ones and one, uh, one plastic one, and of different size, so that they fit into each other. And okay, you, you charge them with a uh, high voltage charger. There are quite a few, how to do. Let's say you can charge it up to 100,000 volt. And I can assure you, when you use something of this size, uh, and you decharge it by connecting to Earth or whatever, it gives you a spark of at least 10 centimeter, uh, and it gives an enormous bang. So that means it is a lot of power behind it. And it might be even lethal if you are not careful. So you showed it to your audience, to your students, and they will be impressed by the spark. And they say, whoa, there is a lot of uh, charge and energy in it. And then you take the thing out of each other. So the inside, yeah, you do that with a stick, which is an isolator. You take it out, the smallest bucket, and then the plastic one and the other one. And then you see, and then you offer the, the, the small container, the inside container, to one of the audience. There will be no one who is, uh, who is uh, brave enough to touch it. They don't dare, because they have seen this spark. And you can do it easily. You will hardly feel anything. So what happens? Well, it leaked away. That's the easiest uh, explanation, of course. That's not true, because when you put all everything together again, you can get the same spark again. So where does the charge come from? What, what is basically, where is the energy source? Physicists might know. It's not in the metal thing, but the field is in this plastic. The molecules of the plastic are de-orientized. Uh, and you can feel it. When you put your hand inside, you feel the electrical field. But there is no charge or whatever. So you can easily take it into your hands. OK, balloons. I, yeah, I should do that. Well, I, do you know how you can, can stick a needle into a balloon without having it exploding? Yeah? You know the trick? You go to a pub and you make a bet with someone. Can you, can you do that, you ask? Yeah, can, you, can you do, stick the needle in the balloon <laughs> without having it exploded? for a beer. <laughs> OK. But you have to know where you uh, This is just an ordinary balloon. There's no tricks on it. No stickers or whatsoever, OK? OK. So. You see? This is real. And it's a real balloon because when I stick it from the side, it explodes, right? <laughs> oh, again, sorry. Well, liquid nitrogen, I couldn't demonstrate it here, but that is a funny thing as well. Uh, you, you can easily, liquid nitrogen, minus, sort of minus 200 cel uh, degrees Celsius, um, it's very easy to put liquid nitrogen in your mouth. You must just trust physics. And uh, when you do, well, here too, and the funny thing is then when you exhale, yeah, the, the air out of your lungs has, contains a lot of uh, uh, humidity and that condenses immediately, so people think you are having fumes and things like that. that uh, there is even a, m a nicer trick, that is you close your mouth <laughs> and you exhale via your nose. So you get two beeps going from your nose, that's really true. The only thing is you have to take care not to swallow the liquid nitrogen. I did only once, not intentionally, but it happened. And then <laughs> physics, it's all physics. Then I don't know if you know what, it, what happens. And most people think, OK, it will be very cold in your stomach because that, this, this thing it was minus 200. That you don't feel that at all. But the thing is, a rule of thumb is that when a liquid becomes a vapor, uh, the volume increases a thousand volts. Yeah? So one centimeter cube becomes a liter. 
Now, a liter of paper in your stomach is not very uh, pleasant feeling, I can tell. It, wa it was uh, luckily less than uh, a liter, I suppose. Well, nothing happened. But I gave an, uh, a presentation, and really, for 10 seconds, I could not speak anymore. I was... <laughs> anyway, okay, so that's the only thing you have to take care of. You don't need to be afraid for your teeth and things like that. Nothing will happen with it. Unless you're repeated 10 times, etc. Then, then everything becomes frozen. Okay, you can do a lot of things with balloons. I told you how to work, uh, how to do it for the thing. Uh, you can heat it up. You can put it on top of a candle, burning candle, without it having a clothing, just to put a little water in it. And the water will never be 100 degrees. And this the rubber does not melt or so by 100 degrees. So nothing happened. There's another trick in the pub for another beer. Uh, balloons and static electricity is very nice to see. Uh, a pro pro propulsion as a rocket for a car that was a problem for children in in, in primary school, uh, you know probably when you blow the balloon and you release the air and you, you okay, it gives this awful noise. I, I will not do that for you. <laughs> it acts exactly like uh, the focal cords of your, uh, the way you speak. And uh, that, that is Bernoulli law and, uh, okay, it's like basically real nice physics behind it. And also you can use it as a model to explain the um, expanding universe. Because there is something very odd. When we observe the universe, it, it seems like everything is moving away from us. It gives you the feeling we are in the center. And uh, when you turn the clock back, then, uh, uh, th then everything should come together. That's where the notion of the Big Bang came from. And that means, well, basically, the Big Bang happened here. Yeah. But the funny thing is, when you use, oh sorry, sorry, when you use the balloon as the universe, so the two-dimensional surface of the balloon is the universe, and you, you uh, draw all kinds of dots on it, then any, you pick any, uh, any well, a certain dot, that is uh, our solar system, or the Earth, whatever, and uh, then you blow and you see, indeed, all the other dots uh, move away from yours. But that, whole, that is true for any dot. So anyone else in the universe, wherever they are, they, any, everyone thinks that they are in the center of the universe. And anyone in the universe sees that anything else moves away from them. Yeah? That's a di difficult notion to grasp. But, okay. To show this and to talk about it, it might help to explain what is expanding the universe, what it means. Okay, I'm, I was supposed to uh, talk about the competitions I will do. Uh, the physics competition is there. They have an international version, so the IFO is the international one. Uh, Young Physicist Tournament, Conference of Young Scientists, Union Science Olympiad, and the European Union uh, EU Science Olympiad, and one of which I only know in the Netherlands, but maybe there are more places. That is what we call the technical tournament. Okay, let's start with that. That is uh, a product left over, so to say, from uh, the year 2005, when we commemorated uh, 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 100 years ago that Einstein published four very important papers. And there was a lot to do in the Netherlands about it, so we had many projects, and one of them was that we had primary school students, right? So age 6 to 12, uh, treat what we call challenges. And I will show you later, uh, later well, soon, the, the what kind of challenges there were. And they, had, they could work with the teacher on it for the whole year. And that mostly they had to do, to make something. And, and there was one day, nationwide, uh, one day they bring in all their stuff and they have to perform, to show how it works. In front of whom? of professors, and that was a very good choice. Professors, university professors in full dress, that was obliged, and the, there was a fantastic atmosphere between these little kids and these people in black, of which they knew they are very, very intelligent, and, uh, and, and, and of course they didn't only look at the performance itself, but also talk with the students, how they did, etc., etc. 
It is a fantastic thing, and since it was such a success, we repeat it every year. And of course, at the end, they get prizes, and this guy is uh, nationwide known because he's uh, presenting an, uh, a program on television about science, but you know, in a very simple way, explains that cetera. So everyone knows him, and everyone wants to be on the picture with the guy. Well, these are the challenges, for instance, for the younger ones, uh, both which can carry the most marbles. And there are restrictions, of course, in the amount of uh, uh, material they can use and things like that. Uh, a dancing submarine here, a submarine that surfaces exactly after three minutes. Uh, so, okay, how do you do that? Uh, okay, so, and every year, basically, we have eight challenges. For each, uh, for each age group, there are two challenges. The Junior Science Olympiad, uh, some of you know about it, uh, that is a mixture between an individual competition and a team competition. And the individual is for multiple choice questions and open questions. And the open question here, last year it was in the Netherlands. I was involved in these things also. And uh, that was in a city called Nijmegen. And there you have a big river. Basically the Netherlands, you know, is a delta. Uh, there are big rivers flowing from Germany and from France via Belgium. Uh, and okay, when there is a load of water, especially in spring when the, when the snow melts, uh, we get an enormous amount of water and that creates sometimes flooding. So to avoid that, this is in, in, uh, such a point. So this is the river, the main one. They created a bypass. And uh, okay, the, the bypass was rather shallow for a good reason. Because when there is not so much water, you want all the water to pass in the main river to prevent sedimentation. Otherwise, the river gets uh, shallower and shallower by time, right? So you need a flow going on, even when it's a small flow. And uh, so, okay, when there's really a lot of water, you need to bypass. And then, uh, according to this formula uh, about the flow in the bypass, they have to answer questions, etc. You can imagine what. And another one, this is an experiment. Well, this is a map of a part of the Netherlands. Amsterdam is here, if you want to know. This all here, including this area and this area, used to be sea. The Southern Sea. The, here it's the North Sea, and this is what was called the Southern Sea. And, uh, well, there were all dikes around it. An enormous distance. And that it costs us a lot of money to maintain. So then, at a certain moment, in the 30s of the last century, they built this dike here. This is 30 kilometers, and uh, that is a lot shorter than the other dikes. Anyway, near this dike, well, this, th now this became sweet water, and here you have salty water. And we use that, we try to use it to create electricity. So you have the North Sea, Eiselmeer is a lake now. Meer means lake, and this is how it looks. So here you have the North Sea, and there you have the, the lake, the former Southern Sea. And th this is in a station where they uh, experiment with the reverse electrodialysis. Uh, so you have mixtures of different uh, of water with different uh, salinity, and when you combine them, you can make a cell out of it. And that was basically the uh, experiment they had to do. Uh, so they had uh, different beakers, uh, or they had two, two beakers, but di different solutions of different salinity, and uh, they had to measure the voltage. They also had to measure the conductivity. And from that, oh my God, from that you could uh, calculate the internal resistance. And for a certain uh, red cell, so the reverse electro, uh, uh, what is it, uh, dialysis, yeah. Uh, and you could uh, calculate the maximum electrical power. That was basically the experiment they had to do. Okay, that was the setup. Shake <laughs> it, Okay, Young Physicist Tournament. That is um, uh, uh, that basically, not basically, in fact, it originates from the Soviet Union. And uh, when I got in touch with this, that was still in Russia held. And uh, for one reason or another, there were 17 open questions, very open questions. And they had to be researched. You cannot say solved. There is not one single answer to this guy. I will show you what kind of question. 
uh, with a team of five students. Th these 17 questions are published a year ahead of the competition. And uh, these 17 students, they do research on it. And they have to make a presentation of it, and they have to, make, to present it uh, during the competition. And in the competition, three teams of five students, they sit together, and they have different roles, and they rotate that. So one is presenting, one is the opponent, and there is a third one, the, the reviewer. And then they turn, and they get different coefficients for uh, what kind of scores they get from the jury. Anyway, okay. So uh, that's what they do. And it is, in contrast to, for instance, the physics Olympiad, uh, it's a competition that's very popular amongst girls. They love it. And they, they, I think they love also to work together. And uh, you can see here, and, and many times I've seen fantastic professional pre presentations. Unbelievable. I mean, these are still high school kids, right? Not students. Well, this is how it works. And there is a jury. And okay. This kind of questions. Yeah? Investigate the motion of a falling winged seed such as an ash or a maple tree. Yeah? The, so this acts as a propeller, basically, uh, which you have on the rotator of the uh, helicopter. So when a heli helicopter has an engine problem, they start, they try to slow down the vertical motion by auto rotation, because that gives kind of a counter force. Okay, and the, the seed does it without knowing, of course. Uh, well, it, it works like that. Since it, it slows the vertical motion, it stays longer in the air, so it's longer pro wind, and that is a way to spread the seeds of a tree in a, in a larger area than when it should drop just vertically, or almost vertically, without this, this thing. Okay, Faraday heaping is also a very funny, funny thing to see. Uh, this, this too, I don't know if you know it, but you try it. You have an, a long string of beads, a flexible cord, and you put it in a beaker, and then you hang one side of the, of the string out of the beaker long enough that it will go by itself due to gravity. And it goes faster, 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 and all of a sudden, it, it is not in touch anymore with the beaker. And that is something very strange. You, know, you understand that this part, okay, that pulls the whole thing, right? There you have the gravitational force. But how on earth something that is just in the air and which is flexible can pull up something which is in this beaker? That's pretty strange. Okay, so they are, were asked to understand how it works and what is important in the hill motion. Oh. Well, the U European Union Science Olympiad, that is also teamwork, uh, three, and but it is science, not just physics, but also biology and chemistry. And uh, okay, so there's a lot of lab work. In this year, it was fantastic in Sweden. Sweden is known for its scrimmies. And uh, okay, in this experiment, they had to know it was a story, Eric Lundberg was killed, he was poisoned, and you had to find out whom did it. And, uh, okay, the physics part in this was that, the, okay, the body was found, and it was already cooled down a little bit, something, and as a model, you had this potato, and uh, you had to see, how, well, it, it was cooked, so it was hot, and then it cooled down, you had, they had to measure it, but they had to rescale it to a real body. Uh, you have to know how you should do that. To be in order to determine the moment he was dead and could started cooling down. And from that, they, you, you would be able to eliminate certain suspects. And the biologist is the same, and the chemist, is, uh, chemist uh, also. So at the end, uh, you combined everything. That was a fun part. It is not three different things, but it all combined. Then you can, can come to a conclusion to know who was the killer. Conference of some scientists is simply that uh, also science, it's not only physics, but mathematics, for instance, as well, uh, that uh, you at school you do a project and you present it to your peers. Okay. Physics Olympiad. Well, you know a lot about it, I think. Can I steal five minutes? The first one was in 67. We, uh, we've seen that famous problem that was, uh, the of which the solution was incorrect. 
uh, and that was held in Poland, by the way. There were five countries, these five countries, they started it. Uh, since then, it has grown enormously. And this year will be held in, po in, uh, in Portugal, and you can see it's over 90. 93 countries will participate. It's the highest number we ever had so far. And uh, so it's a, a major event. It's the largest physics competition in the world, and I don't know, m most probably also the oldest, but anyway. Um, it's quite, quite something for a country that hosts the Olympiad uh, to organize it, I can tell. This is how it looks, because the, the problems are made by the host country and then discussed the night, the day and night before the test is taken. Physicists are very awful people. They, they fight for a comma, you know? And the, these discussions, I've seen it many times now, uh, you start in the afternoon at two o'clock, and uh, well, uh, when the problem is settled, well, you may be happy when everybody agrees about the final text, let's say at 10, 11 o'clock in the evening, right? Then from two o'clock on, and after that, you have to translate it in the mother tongue of the student. So quite a few people have a very short life. And that is repeated afterwards. Uh, basically, they, everyone, when you tell them uh, you go to the Olympiad, you go to a nice country, to Bali or so, so, oh, holiday. But that's not true at all. I mean, the first four days, leaders, true, leaders get hardly any sleep. It's very exhausting. And then it's even not over. Uh, okay. I, I will leave you the details. That is, um, but it is also considered uh, to be the most difficult uh, physical competition we have. Well, the problems nowadays uh, are a little bit different than uh, when it started. Uh, for instance, this one in Denmark, it was about a uh, meteorite that, uh, that f fell down, burned in, this, in the sky and collapsed, etc. So there were a lot of questions, sub-questions, uh, uh, not well, luckily, not all related, so when you could not solve one part, you might be able to solve another part uh, about uh, the melting process of the, uh, the meteorite, its age, where it came from, uh, what would happen if a meteorite, such meteorite would really hit the Earth, and uh, the maximum impact speed, that kind of stuff. An experiment, this one is from Estonia, is that it was very neat. When you put a magnet, a strong magnet, in a shallow, in a, in a beaker with the water just on top of it, one or two millimeters, then you will see that the, uh, the level of the water is not even. There is a dip in it. That is due to the magnetic permeability of the water. But it's very, very tiny. The, the, the deflection, you can see it with your eye, but it's very thin. It's in the order of micrometers. And how do you, when you are able to determine the dip here, then you can tell something about the permeability. And the trick was with a laser, uh, a laser pointer, and you had get a reflection, and from the reflection, you get a certain image, you had to determine the shape of the water there. Okay, last thing. These students, in all these competitions, they come together, and in general, uh, the, the, the ones who uh, are in these competitions, okay, they are interested in science. And that is not the case with all your students in, in your classroom. Uh, maybe the majority doesn't care. And when you're a really good one, you might be the only one in the class or even the only one in that school who is on that level. That makes you feel quite lonely. And now they see people, students, they have the same fascination. They like to talk about it. And when you're very good in physics in high school, you're not going to discuss difficult problems with someone because they don't understand and they will leave you immediately. But now they can. And this is the effect of peers. It gives them an enormous stimulus to, uh, to proceed and to feel happy about it, for maybe for the first time in their life. And uh, many of them make friendships that will last till the end of their lives. That's, very f that's absolutely correct. Okay, that was my story. Thank you very much. <laughs>